In this video, we're going to discuss waxes. So waxes are one more component that is derived from fatty acids. A standard wax is just an ester. It's got a little alcohol side, it's got a carboxylic acid side, but these involve very long chain alcohols and very long chain carboxylic acids. So these are lipids. They are extremely nonpolar. The ester is just the tiniest bit polar, and you have these massive carbon chains. Waxes get used in a lot of different ways in biology. One of the most common is that they're hydrophobic. They help repel water. And so leaves will coat themselves in a very thin layer of a wax. This is because water, if it just hit the leaf without the wax, would cling to it. And the leaves aren't that strong, and the weight of the water from rainfall would quickly overwhelm and break the leaf off. By coating it in a tiny bit of wax, the droplet runs down, it actually can be shaped to run towards the roots, and so trees that have very wide spread out large amounts of leaves, instead of losing them to rainfall, use them with a little coat of wax to slip and slide, more or less, that water towards its root system. So they're very good at protecting surfaces against water. This is also why you'll use it on skis and the snowboards and the like. It doesn't just make something slippery so you can go over the snow better. It actually keeps the snow from clinging to skis or snowboards. And so you don't get caught up, held down, and locked in by the snow nearly as much. Additionally, on humans and other creatures, we tend to have waxes that get onto our skin or our hair. Birds have them in their feathers. Lots of times there's oils that do it, but waxy oils are part of that. The wax helps waterproof bird feathers so they can float nicely on the water. Humans, well, there's earwax that we're used to on the inside. There's actually lots of thin layer of wax on the outside of the ear. Our ears are very thin, and so if water, if it's cold outside and water starts to freeze and you have a little on it, it latches on really easily, grows crystals, can ice over, and do damage to our thin skin parts fairly easily. But a thin layer of wax helps prevent water from ever collecting on it. And so even though the ear can get quite cold, it doesn't have this external risk of water landing on it, helping freeze it all the quicker. And so it's used to help prevent frostbite a little bit. Additionally, waxes can be ablative. They take the damage first, and so the oils and the waxes that end up in our hair and the like can help prevent the hair from taking significant damage from the ultraviolet light. Now, they'll still take some, but that oil can be replaced much easier than regrowing the entire hair. And so it helps to protect from various damages. Well, how big are these R chains? If you have a 16 carbon carboxylic acid, and your alcohol is a 30 carbon alcohol. This is beeswax. A total of 46 carbons surrounding that ester. A little bit more on one side than the other, but this is beeswax. These are very large. However, because they're long carbon chains, their solid form is not particularly strong. It's malleable, it can be squished and bent and rolled, it can be shaped, but it does hold fairly well once it's in a shape. And so this is why wax bees can make honeycombs, they can make nice good structures, seal them up, build larger structures out of them, but in the end we can squish it, roll it, make candles out of it. It is a malleable solid. Now, this is because it doesn't fracture. Unlike a crystal of small things that would break in little bits, these long tails are so long that even if you squish it, they're still trapped inside each other. So they don't tend to shatter and break apart down some nice dividing line, like smaller molecules might have a dividing line you can break down. But if you have a lot of various long chains interacting with each other, there's not really anywhere you can easily divide. You can squish, and so they'll move and slide, but even then they're still largely in contact with each other. And so waxes tend to have a more squishy, more malleable form. Next group we want to talk about today is the steroids. So normally when you think of steroids, you, most people think of anabolic 
steroids, weightlifter drugs designed to grow more muscle more quickly and have terrible side effects, baseball or sports scandals and the like. And while this is indeed one set of steroids, the reality is steroids is just a class of lipids. They all have the same general structure that things are attached to. They are these interconnected six-membered rings followed by a another six-membered ring followed by a five-member ring. This is called the scaffold. This is the general shape that steroids take. It is a lot of hydrocarbons. It is a multi-ring system. Things can be attached to it. You can have various groups come off different spots, methyls places. You can have things in different spots that come off of it. What those things are, or if you add double bonds in places and the like, all of that will change which steroid you are. But the idea to be a steroid, all you have to do is have this general shape. Well, steroids have a lot of uses. Some are things like grow your muscles. But they don't do it directly, because what they really are isn't a miracle thing that grows muscles or anything else. They're signals. Steroids interact with other machinery in the body. So we get to proteins and enzymes later on. You'll see some of the things, but they are signals. One part of your body says, hey, I need to do something. I need the rest of the body to do this. And it puts steroids into the system. They float around. They interact with other cells. Those cells say, oh, hey, I'm getting a lot of signals to ramp up this behavior or ramp down this behavior. Or I need to activate inflammation to fight off infection or damage. Or I need to stop doing that. They are signal molecules so that one part of your body can tell another part of your body to be doing something or not doing something. Well, signal molecules come in a variety. The most common ones we tend to think of are things like hormones. So one of the most common signals is, hey, teenage years hit, puberty, start ramping up production of the sex hormones and start adapting the body in whichever ways those require. Well, for an example for a few here, that's what most of us probably are familiar with steroids with. Things like testosterone or estrogen. And so we can see a few examples of different steroids here. They all have the same four ring systems. The sex hormones actually have fairly similar components. We've got an alcohol on that one way up here. We have those three chiral centers. So you'll see the hydrogens up or down. They help shape the direction. There's an extra methyl hanging out. But then we'll notice there's some difference. Testosterone, O-N-E, is a ketone. There's a nearby double bond, but it is a ketone down on that left six-atom ring. If we look at estrogen, it's an phenol. So if you're on a what looks like a benzene ring and you have an OH directly attached, that's actually a special kind of alcohol called a phenol. So phenol for benzene ring, alcohol for alcohol, phenols. They're a bit more acidic than a regular alcohol, so their properties are a little bit different. And in this case, you also lose a lot of geometry. One of our Chiral carbons on testosterone is gone. It doesn't exist in estrogen. Way back in time, life evolved the ability to sy synthesize steroids, and then duplicate genes emerged to slightly alter those steroids. And over time, we started creating many, many different versions because that had a lot of neat stereochemistry possible. However, Every time you modify it, you change the type of groups it can interact with. When we get to proteins and enzymes, we'll talk about active sites and binding sites. But the short version is, if you have a shape that more or less fits all of these, but one of these has OH groups, 
Well, that's going to interact pretty well with that OH at the end of estrogen. But if it also had a flat benzene of its own in the background, that would line up pretty well with that flat benzene-like component of the estrogen. And so you get two flat rings interacting. That's pretty good nonpolar interactions. If you tried to put testosterone in here, the OHs might line up, but the chiral center of that methyl actually tells us that it doesn't line up very well with that benzene group because the ring for testosterone actually has some shape. It doesn't get nice and flat. And so this pocket wouldn't fit testosterone very well, but it would fit estrogen. And this is part of how you send signals. Parts of your body have a little pocket, kind of like a lock designed for one specific molecule to fit into it, kind of like a key. And so they have to find the right receptor. And so all the slight differences in our cholesterols are to bind to different receptors. So we take something about the same shape and size designed to fit estrogen here, and we try to lay it on cholesterol. Well, that doesn't work. There's a big tail. Cholesterol has this extra long bit that doesn't fit into this shape. By adding those extra carbons, it's going to not fit into that same position. And so cholesterol doesn't tend to interfere in things where estrogen was supposed to work, and estrogen doesn't tend to interfere with things where cholesterol is supposed to work. Cholesterol is an example of one where it's not a signal. There's no reason steroids have to be a signal. Well, they indeed were signal molecules with these first two hormones. Cholesterol, main purpose is to break up fats. Cholesterol is produced naturally in the body. We also ingest some, but we can make all we need. So if you eat too much from outside sources, you tend to have high cholesterol. It is good at breaking up fats. It gets into the fat and can separate them. It has a little bit of OH so that it can kind of drift along with some of the bile juices that we dump into our intestines because our fats don't really make it through the stomach broken down like other foods do. They move through mostly intact. What happens is those fats don't break down the stomach because that's full of polar water with acid. And so your stomach juices don't do much to fats, but once they're in your intestines, we dump a bunch of bile fluids, one of which contains cholesterols and your fat molecules. Simplified here, but remember that it's your triester with glycerol. These fat molecules hold together pretty well, and so they don't really want to fall apart. But if a cholesterol can work its way in between them, it can force the two fat molecules to separate. And so cholesterol just kind of slices them up into smaller and smaller bits, which then the cells can absorb and start to break down. And so your intestine does most of the work on fat. Eats too much fat, and, well, your intestines can't process it fast enough. Things like hydrocortisone, these help prevent inflammation and the like. Your cells naturally, if they're exposed to certain damages, will send out signals that trigger inflammation. Hydrocortisone can get in and stop that. It interferes with the signal. It can block up and say, nope, stop doing this. And so you can shut down some of those responses. And so this is why hydrocortisone, you can buy, buy it in tubes that you can rub on for things like mosquito bites. It also has lots of other medical applications. But here's a few examples of different types of steroids. They can do a large variety of things. We tend to hear the name only for illicit drugs, but they re but they really are just a large series of molecules that have these four rings, and then as other groups are attached, they can interact with different parts of our cells. Additional interesting point on cholesterol. It's very thick in the cell wall. So if you have a cell wall and you have your phospholipids, well, one of the problems with the cell wall is that those lipids aren't actually stuck to each other. So if, if you had a bunch of phospholipids and you could mark one, it doesn't stay there. It moves. It'll jump over here. It'll jump there. It'll drift around other parts of the cell. It can even flip and become an inside one, or an inside one can be an outside one. 
those lipids are mobile. It's called a fluid mosaic. They can move around. But if you can get a little bit of cholesterol in there, they act like gates. They slip in, and then any lipid that's in between them can only bounce around in between them. They can't slide past the way they could with another lipid. And so cholesterol in the cells helps sol sort of solidify, or at least reduce the mobility of sections of our cell wall. These become called lipid rafts. You have stable areas, which is usually where, and when we get to proteins, we'll see more, but proteins will sit. If you have a large protein that's anchored and sticking out, often that protein is actually sitting inside a lipid raft to help hold itself into place. So just a few extra interesting bits about steroids. These are another class all into their own of our class of lipids.